200 years ago, England was the world's greatest superpower. It was also the world's greatest slave trader. Ships by the hundreds sailed from Britain's shores for the West African coast, where crews employed brutal methods to capture and enslave their human cargo for the fields and plantations of the New World. Not only was this inhumane practice highly profitable, it was national policy. Planners and traders leveraged their tremendous wealth to exercise powerful influence in Parliament. Few voices were raised in protest. The British slave trade represented a portion of the British economy, not unlike the portion of the economy here in the U.S. that's tied up with the defense industry. Anyone hoping to abolish this slave trade would need intelligence, grace, influential friends, the gift of oration, and most of all, faith. It would take years of tireless, thankless, and failed efforts to wake a nation's passion for freedom and justice. But 200 years ago, one man and his friends did indeed stand up against this injustice and started a movement that would change the world. That man was William Wilberforce. Born in 1759 in the city of Hull, England, Wilberforce was small, sickly, and frail. His physical condition didn't improve much with adulthood. Later, he would be described as all soul and no body. But he did develop a powerful intellect and had an uncommonly beautiful voice that was as charming and beguiling as it was convincing. He attended Cambridge in 1776, where he met William Pitt, who would become his lifelong friend and the youngest prime minister in British history. They worked together for years to help end the slave trade. And although Pitt was overwhelmed by the war against Napoleon's France, Wilberforce had in William Pitt no greater friend to ending the slave trade. At the age of 21, Wilberforce ran for election in the House of Commons and won. Wilberforce later confessed that his early political aim was not to serve others. The first years I was in Parliament, I did nothing, nothing that is to any purpose. My own distinction was my darling object. All that changed in 1785. In November of that year, Wilberforce wrote William Pitt saying that he was in the midst of a spiritual transformation, an ongoing process he would later refer to as his great change. Wilberforce explained that he was searching for a calling in life and that from now on, his political views would have to follow his conscience and his convictions. Pitt urged him to remain in politics. Surely the principles of Christianity lead to action as well as meditation. Oh, excellent point. Allow me to meditate on it before I decide on any action. Just think about this, Wilbur. The slave trade has 300 MPs in its pocket. It would be just you against them. But you could do it. would do it. Wilberforce's faith and profession were at a crossroads. Did his new beliefs require him to leave his position in government? Or should he remain in Parliament? Could his career also be his calling? And so he made a decision to visit an old family friend for advice. The man was a former slave trader known for his profanity and violence until he too had experienced a religious conversion. John Newton was now a 60-year-old pastor who had written a hymn entitled Amazing Grace. Wilberforce wrote a, a note in secret to Newton, asked for permission to meet with him, and said, you mustn't tell anyone about this. The face of a member of parliament is so well known, I don't want to be seen consorting with an evangelical. And Wilberforce walked to Charles Square in London where Newton lived, and he couldn't summon up the courage to knock on the door. He walked around the square once and twice and finally knocked on the door. And it couldn't have been a wiser choice. Newton had been through a lot of storms in his own life. All of the circumstances that gave rise to his great hymn, Amazing Grace. He had a wealth of experience and he was the perfect person for a troubled young man to turn to. It would be a defining moment of his life. Upon leaving that day, Wilberforce later wrote, 
I found my mind in a calm, tranquil state, more humbled and looking more devoutly up to God. After two years of encouraging Wilberforce in his new faith, Newton challenged him. It is hoped and believed that God has raised you up for the good of the church and the good of the nation. Who knows that but for such a time as this, God has brought you into public life and has a purpose for you. Newton's words proved to be prophetic and Wilberforce returned to Parliament a changed man. He was ready for a mission when approached by the early abolitionist Thomas Clarkson, who lobbied him to take the anti-slavery cause up before the House. Clarkson's horrific evidence detailing the cruel trade of slavery moved Wilberforce into action. On October 28, 1787, Wilberforce penned these memorable lines in his diary. God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. The movement had found its champion. Later that year, Wilberforce brought a motion to the House of Commons for the abolition of the slave trade. It would be 20 long years, 20 years filled with frustration, duplicity, and disappointment before he would carry the House of Commons and the House of Lords in putting abolition into law. In fact, due to a severe illness from which he nearly died, it would take Wilberforce two years just to bring his first parliamentary speech against the slave trade. For three and a half hours, he outlined its brutal realities, presenting for many the first glimpse into slavery's grim practices. He concluded, Having heard all this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. Parliament responded with typical delay tactics. In the midst of the political chicanery, the great Methodist reformer John Wesley wrote Wilberforce a letter of support and encouragement. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them stronger than God? It was the last letter Wesley ever wrote. He died a week later. But his words must have stayed with Wilberforce as he faithfully endured 13 more years of consecutive defeats in Parliament. Finally, after failure upon failure, finally after hours of debate which lasted into the pre-dawn hours of February 24, 1807, a resolution to end the slave trade in all of Britain was passed at four in the morning. It was a moment like, unlike any other in British history. The House of Commons rose as one man and applauded for several minutes on end Wilberforce. And he sat there with the tears streaming down his face. The historian G.M. Trevelyan has said, speaking of the abolition of the slave trade, that it was one of the turning events in the history of the world. More than two decades later, on July 26, 1833, word from London was rushed to Wilberforce as he lay gravely ill. The House of Commons had cast a decisive vote of victory to outlaw slavery throughout its empire. 800,000 slaves were freed. Three days later, William Wilberforce died and was buried in Westminster Abbey. Free Africans in New York City wrote a formal eulogy and had it delivered to England. Harriet Beecher Stowe praised Wilberforce in the pages of Uncle Tom's Cabin, and Abraham Lincoln invoked his memory in a famous speech. Wilberforce speaks to us so powerfully because he is probably the best example we have of someone who carried his faith into the public square to write a great human rights abuse. And he is one of a, a great tradition that we're familiar with here in America. One thinks of Martin Luther King Jr. and his passionate pursuit of civil rights. Faith was the basis for Dr. King's pursuit of social justice. The same is the case with Wilberforce. Like Dr. King, his faith was the source of first principles that inspired him on the fight to end first the slave trade and later slavery itself. Today, exactly 200 years after Parliament cast its historic vote to outlaw the slave trade, the mission and the movement of Wilberforce and his friends continues. Today, people of courage and conviction are putting their faith into action, taking a stand for the weakest and most vulnerable, those who have no voice and need our help, following the footsteps of the hero of humanity, William Wilberforce. Thank you.